Ready to go? All right, everybody ready to start? Yeah? <laughs> okay, so let's start. Sorry about the delay, folks. Uh, weather permitted. We thought we'd start a bit later due to some people obviously getting held up in traffic and whatnot due to the rain, but uh, yeah, let's go. So, technical SEO fundamentals in 2019. So, why am I qualified to be here and talk to you guys? Who am I? My name's Dan Ladanovsky, right? I've been an SEO since I was 14. I've been doing this 13 years. Got my first number one ranking at age 15. Built a custom script site, which got 35,000 visitors a day, roughly a million visitors a month at age 18. Ran, a, ran, build, created a site from scratch, including development, content, SEO links, called Build Sydney. That is now the number one construction site in the city. And I manage some of the biggest accounts for SEO in Australia, working at Prosperity Media. So, tools required for a technical analysis for SEO, right? What you need for any website is you need Google Search Console access. Anybody uh, doing a tech audit, tech analysis, and getting into the technical weeds of a SEO audit, you need Google Search Console access and crawling software. Two software, two pieces of software that are great are Screaming Frog and Sitebold. So, website speed. Why is it important? Well, Google came out last year, roughly this time, and said it's a ranking factor. So, when Google says, we listen. How do we test the speed of a site? Few tools we can use. I like GT Metrics. Um, it gives you a percentage grade score that you can pretty much run. You just plug your URL in and uh, it'll give you an output of the metrics on your site. It'll tell you what kind of needs to be improved upon, whether it be JavaScript error codes, whether it be images being too large, etc. And we'll compare this to other sites on the internet. Roughly, you don't want your site going lasting any more than three seconds. You want your site loading in three seconds. We use Google PageSpeed Insights. So PageSpeed Insights is a Google tool. It's okay. I mean, I do prefer GT Metrics, surprisingly, even though PageSpeed Insights has been recently updated. I do find Google pay, uh, GT Metrics to be more real world over, um, over PageSpeed. I don't know why that is. It's just been in my analysis, in my test. So I do prefer GT. We test the ping server time. So this is done by going ping uh, CMD. And if you're in Windows, CMD, ping URL. This will give you your, both your IP address of your site and also the milliseconds it took to reach the, to reach the web server and came back to, uh, to your server, to your site. Same thing in terminal. Open up the command line, ping your URL, and you'll get the same numbers. You'll get a millisecond number, and you'll get a your, uh, IP address. And again, of course, testing it in the real world, I mean, there's no better test than opening up your browser, whether it be a desktop or a mobile, seeing how your site goes. So, ways you can ensure that your website speed is quick. We always use a localized server. So, if your target market is Australia, Sydney, there's great services you can use. So, you can use Venture IP, Panther, or most recently, Google Cloud that has like CDN um, servers in Sydney. They're very, very fast, very quick, and it's also a ranking factor. So Google does look at where your site is located when it's ranking it. You can, you can have a .com, have servers in Belgium, and rank in Belgium. Google will see it as a Belgium site. Uh, images on CDN or compressed. So you want to make sure that your images, either if you have a lot of images on a site, if you're a very image-heavy site, you'd want to have your images on a CDN. This is particularly true if you have a multi kind of country site where you know you have visitors in America, UK, Australia, and you can't get the server right next to them. It wouldn't work as well if you're just targeting Australia for that. Um, you probably just can keep the images on your site and you can just like compress the images as much as you can without losing too much quality. Google came out with a tool called Squoosh, which is great. I mean, it reduces the, uh, reduces the image by roughly 80 to 90% whilst keeping quality, which is great. Another tactic you could actually use is converting over to a a format called .webp. It's quite new. Um, not every browser supports it, but the majority of the ones do. So the latest Google Chrome browsers, I think above 48, 51, all produce, um, all uh, pretty much include .wp, and so does a Safari. Just the older IE versions don't. Removing unnecessary or legacy scripts from the page, this is an obvious one. I mean, if you have a legacy site, 
you don't want to be having these scripts running on the background, right? You don't want any scripts taking over like 1,500 milliseconds. This can be checked in Google PageSpeed or GT Metrics. Um, just ensure that if they are taking that long, they're required and necessary for your site. You want to make sure that they're actually not impacting your site negatively in terms of speed. Consider using a cache. I mean, there's a lot of 40% of sites, 30, sorry, 30% of sites on internal WordPress. So plugins like WP Super Cache are great. Um, but again, it just depends on the, it just depends, it's a case by case basis if you want to use caching. So website structure. Let's go back to basics. So H1, I see a lot of sites, I, I cannot believe the amount of sites I see that have more than one H1 tag. Think of H1 as like a book cover, book title. Make sure you only have one H1 tag. H2, H3, H4, H5, H6, I mean, they should be used in order of priority, right? H2s, I mean, you can have a few. Just make sure you're using them where required, when necessary. Another thing I see quite often is the length of the H1 and H2s. People sometimes take them too short, people sometimes have them too long. The correct amount is you don't want to have any more than a page title tag. 50 characters, 40 to 55 characters, I think is ideal. Um, it's, I've just personally seen the best results in it, but again, that's up for debate. Structuring the site, web stylers. So this is a great little article I got on builtvisible.com. They came out and like said like, this is the type of site architecture that we regularly see. And if we look at it, it's actually quite messy and it's very, very difficult for the pages down here to get ranked. And this is a big issue when it comes to bigger sites, particularly e-commerce sites. What's the solution? This is the solution. So deep linking from the home page or the most powerful page onto your secondary, third tier, fourth tier, paginated level category pages. Also, interlinking your main category pages one by one also helps drastically, helps spread the page, page rank a lot better. So as I've just said, yeah, it's, it spreads the page rank, um, passes link juice to the deep pages. This is very important. A lot, of, a lot of people make the mistake of not interlinking their money pages correctly. This is one of the most underrated aspects of SEO, of on-page SEO, should I say, that are just overlooked, and it could be a quick win if you're not implementing it. Again, prioritizing your, uh, your internal pages, how can this be done? So, we use a tool called Ahrefs, and we go and click a, click a put your URL in, go down to the bottom, click best, best pages by links. This will give you your best pages by links, then you sort it by UR. So there you've just get given what pages are the most powerful in terms of your link profile. Then what you can do is you can use a series of internal linking to actually create links from these pages to your money pages, which is ideal if you, don't, if you can't build natural backlinks to these pages or you, you really can't get, get that page ranking for your, like, your main keyword or your head term. That is the best strategy you can implement by far. So now we're going to talk about structured data. So structured data, it's a very big area, very complex area, and very deep. Tools I use to get my head around schema, I go to the back to base and get the two best resources on the internet. They are schema.org. Um, pretty much there's no better resource than actually like the, foot, the, I guess the handbook for the actual whole resource itself. And Google structured data guidelines are also great. So you can see what's happening. Uh, within um, how, it, or how it correlates to the Google search. How to test schema, so there's two, there's two great tips here. So Google structured data test, you can pretty much put any URL in and get an output if your data is valid. Um, and rich snippets report, although like it's not great, this is an old Webmaster Tools feature um, that's being propagated into Google Search Console, but it's not as good as yet as the structured data test. So some schema tips here for you guys right quick. It might be a little bit intermediate to advanced level, but bear with me. So how do we get rich snippets from HTML? So Google has been known to pull out data out of a table and extract it. This is the code that you use. It's pretty much a standard table um, code. However, the data that Google's been pulling out recently is great. It's really great. It's a great CTR factor. It's extra real estate and it adds extra vital data. I'll give you an example of what it is. Oh, my apologies, it's not here. Continuing on. <laughs> my apologies, people, this happens sometimes. All right, so let's go, let's go into schema here and let's get some tips happening. So here's an example of schema. 
So this code right here, this is just some information for a local business, right? This is a, a business selling uh, what we have here, new furnace installation, the minimum payment, payment due, etc. Here's the microdata version of the schema, Candle Complex, I'll, I'll run you through it. So we've got item a prop, item scope. That is the person schema that they're doing. What this is, is this is an MTE or multi-type entity schema. And how this works is it combines one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different forms of schema into one. And this is getting the highest, by far, highest CTR, highest click-throughs, best rankings of any type of schema that's av available out there right now. This is the microdata version of it. This is the JSON version of it. This is what schema looks like. I'm happy for anybody that comes down after. I'll give them the slides, just uh, come up to me and I'll give you all this information if you're interested. But um, again, this is how the schema is broken down. See, we've got local business, we define local business, we define person, we define price specification, we define payment complete, we define product, order, and service. I mean, you're really telling Google what the page is about, and this is a huge ranking factor. So going back from earlier, I mentioned uh, what the table schema looks like. Here is what it looks like. So what it is, is you've got, your, you've got your actual listing, but then here, this extra schema, this extra part of the SERPs, this comes on top of your, your listing. And what it is, is that it gives you extra information that your page is about. As I said before, it's a great ranking factor, and it adds extra data. It goes one step further, though. Here's an uh, here's example from Wikipedia. This is a great example because it's pulling the exact same data out, but it's linking. And these links, they link to anything you have in the table data. So if you're putting an Ahrefs like HTML link, if you're linking inside the table, Google picks that up and it actually like sees it as a link. And these links actually go to your site. So now all of a sudden you have one, two, three, four links, thanks to schema, going to your website. It's amazing. All right, product schema. Product schema is huge. It's probably one of the biggest schemas used, particularly in e-commerce SEO. This is what it looks like when done correctly. So here's, I've used the Walmart example. You've got the aggregate rating, you've got the amount of reviews, you've got the price range, and you've got the availability. That's what it looks like on a, on a desktop. Here's what it looks like on a mobile. Again, it just really stands out. The URL of the product, the rating, the price, the availability. I mean, anybody seeing this versus another listing, it's just obvious that they're gonna click this. It takes up so much more real estate. It looks better and it's gonna get the click through. So this is how it looks. Product rating, product, we put the aggregate rating. When doing aggregate rating, be sure that you're using proper internal reviews so if your users can actually make a review on the page specific for that product and ensure that if you cannot get that details, ensure you're pulling the data from either product review or trust pilot. A lot of our clients we've seen can get hit for like spammy structure markup, for example, because they haven't done this correctly or implemented it correctly. So that's definitely one thing to watch out for when doing the star ratings and schema. Another thing, if we look here, we've pretty much got the offer schema. So this is another version, this is another example of MTE or multi-type entity. And uh, we're putting the price, we're putting um, that it's in stock, and we're putting the image in. So this is where it's getting all the data from, and this is what Google's outputting. And I mean, it's great, it works, and it takes up that extra real estate that actually drives more click-throughs for your website. Featured snippets. Now, everybody knows featured snippets. I'm sure you've maybe seen this before. Um, yeah, as you can see, it's massive, massive CTR factor. 50 plus percent, it's great to have. How do you get it? There's a markup, surprisingly. Featured snippet markup. Putting this onto your site, can be great. It tells Google that this is the exact content that you want marked up as featured snippet. A great tip is uh, seeing what other featured snippets are in your niche, seeing that like you already know that term or that keyword is getting a result for a featured snippet and bettering it, including most of the keywords that are in it, and ensuring that the length of your featured snippet is no more than 55 characters as well. 55 characters is about the length uh, of most feature snippets, apologies, 55, yeah, characters, correct. Or words, 55 characters or words. Test it. Okay. All right, 
on-site SEO optimization, XML sitemap. So ensuring we want all the links indexed within the sitemap XML file, include images in the sitemap, ensure proper priority is set to the pages, often home page, category pages, etc. This is a big one. Now, within an XML sitemap, you can prioritize which sites or which pages, should I say, of the site get priority indexing. 1.0 means that's the highest priority version of your site. That's the site, that's the page of the site you want most crawled by Google. So this would normally be the page that gets uh, most renewed with fresh content. You wanna ensure that that's the page that's 1.0. You don't wanna be putting that 1.0 tag on multiple pages because you'll exhaust your Google crawl budget. And that's not something you want happening. You want Google going to the main page that's gonna like, I guess normally for this uh, instance, the home page is the page you want 1.0. Internal pages, you want about 0.3. And category level pages, you want about 0.7 if you want a rough guide. You want to ensure that the external sitemap files are linked in the robots.txt. This is simply done by sitemap, semicolon, and the link to the sitemap. And uh, ensure you submit your sitemap to Google, Bing, Yahoo, Yandex, Naver, which any other search engine that accepts external sitemaps. This can be done within Search Console, Bing Webmaster Tools, etc tools we use to create the XML sitemap. So if you're using WordPress, you know, feel free to use like the Yoast WordPress plugin. This creates uh, quite a good sitemap. It separates it by posts, pages, images, etc. XMLsitemaps.com is good. This is just for if you have a general site that's kind of not running on a CMS. And uh, my personal favorite is Screaming Frog. This creates a brand new XML sitemap for you. It scrapes all the webs, all the pages on your site and it creates an XML sitemap for you ready to upload. All right, meta keywords. This is an interesting one, I always see it. So Google came out in 2009 and said not to use meta keywords. Um, pretty much a spam signal. You're pretty much telling Google, these are the keywords we wanna rank for. That's what we're gonna, it's almost seen as keyword stuffing if you really look at what it is. And I'd, I'd highly advise just removing those keywords. They provide no value. Meta descriptions. Now, for optimal Google viewing, you want to be about 920 pixels, which is about 158 characters long. That's the length of an ideal optimal Google meta description. Google recently changed it. They went up to 300, they came back down to 180, but we found that 920 pixels is normally the length and the pixel width they allow for meta descriptions across all sites. For mobiles, it changes. It goes to 120 characters or 680 pixels. So keep that in mind if you're targeting for mobile sites. If you're targeting uh, pages and you specifically want mobile traffic, keep those numbers in mind as they're gonna be more important. For Yahoo and Bing, again, um, it's about 168 characters with a pixel length of 980, so it's a bit longer than Google. Again, if you're targeting those search engines, that's what you wanna optimize. And uh, just, to, just to be clear here, think a lot of people think meta descriptions is a way to keyword stuff and like, so like, you know, be as descriptive as possible. I agree to an extent, but you've already captured the person's attention reading the meta description. I like to see it as the title tag captures the attention. The meta description should sell the person on what the content's about. Like it really should. It really should, I guess, emphasize for them to come onto your site. That's really what you're trying to go for with the meta description. All right, robust the text. Hey, no, no. No, no page was missed. Thank you though, thank you for your concern. <laughs> so you wanna ensure you're using a robots.txt tag. A robots.txt is essentially a text file you put onto your site which tells search engines where to go and where not to go. You wanna ensure that search engines, you don't wanna ensure that you're putting a disallow, forward slash, semicolon, forward slash. This blocks your whole website from search, uh, search engines. Unless of course you're in development mode or you're just testing. But if you have a live site that you want indexed, be sure that you don't have that code on there. Um, that's detrimental. Any, yeah, that works. All right, canonical tag. This one confuses a lot of people. So you wanna ensure that using the real canonical tag on pages which have duplicate content. So essentially, canonical tag in layman's terms. When you have similar pages, that are ranking for similar keywords. You wanna ensure that the, key, the page you want ranking, all the canonical tags are pointing to that page. 
The whole point here is not to have the same page ranking for the same keywords or, or for the similar content. This is a particularly a problem if your content is duplicate, if you have the same content on two pages, you want to tell Google not to, not to index that one page and send all the page rank to that important page, the one you actually want getting traffic. Um, pages can be self-referencing, so top canonical tags can be included on a page where, for example, you've just created a new article on the latest development in Sydney, there's no other content on the page like that, so the, con the canonical tag can be self-referencing and be that URL of that page. And again, like you want to be using this on a case-by-case -case basis. There is no site-wide or one fit one like size fits all canonical tag. Again, like when you are looking through a site, you want to be using this code strategically. I guess the caveat here is if it's self-referencing, that's fine. But if it's not self-referencing, use it with a grain of salt and, and know one thing as well. Google does not always honor this tag. I'd say maybe 80 to 90% of times Google honors the canonical tag. So keep that in mind. You might still get some pages having duplicate content in the index. That's because it just happens. And why that happens? I mean, Google just, it's because Google just doesn't honor it 100% of the time. So image SEO. How do we optimize images? Well, I like to keep images below 200 kilobytes as a maximum. I like to ensure all images have alt tags describing what the image is. And when I buy, buy alt tags, I don't mean, you know, pink panther, I mean, the pink panther is on the ground sitting, right? You wanna be more descriptive with it. You wanna ensure that the URL of the image has the keywords in it so it describes the image well. You wanna create an XML sitemap that creates all the image codes as well. So you want all the links to all the images in a separate XML sitemap as to uh, where the, where the uh, pages are. So it's, you know, its own sitemap that you can submit. You wanna use unique images, of course. I mean, there's a lot of ways around this. Instagram filters are known to like break the unique uniqueness of an image. You know, going black and white can break it. Cropping it can break it. Turning it sideways can break it. So there's a lot of ways to avoid this. But again, I, this is not ethical and I'm not condoning this, but thought I'd throw that in there for you guys. Um, always include a caption under the image, describing the image and what it's about. And I'd say most, maybe the most important thing is ensure that the page the image is on has relevant content to the image. That's a massive one. So what does an optimized image look like? That's the end result. It's optimized image, you know, can get these types of rankings. Remember, Google Images is the second biggest search engine after Google itself, so it's always handed out. All right, Search Console, checking the page for errors. Now, how do we do this? We go into Google Search Console, we get into coverage, we then check for errors. I was going through my own site on the weekend. I found that I even I had errors and I had a look at what it was. I've since verified and sorted out the problem. But the gist of this is you're going in, you're looking for pages that have an error, have an issue that could be a 404, 500 internal error, anything really. And uh, you want to then sort out the issue and then you want to verify the page again that it's gone, that the issue is cleared and you can resolve the problem. Checking for manual penalties, this is a big one. So when you're going onto a site, when you're doing some analysis of your own site, you want to ensure that you know, the site, your site can rank, right? You want to ensure that nothing too terrible has happened to it that you know, you've just suddenly dropped out of the index. How do we do this? Manual actions. So into Google Search Console, manual actions. Thankfully, I've got no issues detected, but uh, be careful for a few issues that might come up. You want to watch for spammy structure markup. You want to watch for an inbound link penalty, and you want to watch for an outbound link penalty. So those two things can come about from you linking to very dodgy sites, right? You linking to like spam, junk, you know, I guess random like niche sites that are just like made for, con made for money, really. They have no, provide no value. These are the type of links you want to avoid linking out to. And the same goes as vice versa. You don't want those pages linking to you. Security issues, similar to manual actions, click security issues. Again, thankfully, no issues detected. But you gotta watch out for this because you know if your site's been playing up, if you've been hacked, if you've got any like SQL injections or anything like that, it'll normally come up here. And both manual actions and security issues, they're pretty bad, and you want to get those fixed as soon as possible. So if you do come across these issues on your site as a matter of priority, get them fixed, get them checked out, get them looked into. Chrome Developer Tools. This is a neat little. Um, this is a neat little uh, tool that Google just came out with a few maybe a month or two ago actually. 
And uh, here's an example of what it is. So it's actually within Google Chrome itself. And what it does is allows you to do a little cheeky audit. And uh, you, know, you can see viewport, you can see it's got title tags, meta descriptions. It'll tell you if your um, structured data is valid, although albeit they make you do a manual test. Um, it'll tell you, you know, if your sitemap is not linking in robots.txt to the right place, it'll tell you that it's an error. How do we get there? We go Google Chrome, settings, more tools, developer tools, audits, and then run audit. And uh, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you all very much. <laughs>